Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Amy Cruz. I will be one of your panelists for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are the Community Budget Alliance. We are a coalition of 25 local organizations and community members who believe that the city budget should be a people's budget. Uh, part of the Community Budget Alliance, we have uh, several working groups and one of them is the Redefining Public Safety. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and uh, part of this working or this work group is made up of the following organizations, Pillars of the Community, um, Mid City Can, the ACLU of San Diego and Imperial Counties, Planned Parenthood Action Fund of the Pacific Southwest, Youth Will, the Center of Pon on Pol Policy Initiatives and Alliance San Diego. So the Redefining Public Safety Work Group advocates for community based uh, public safety initiatives and divestment from the system of over-policing and incarceration. We believe the city should reimagine public safety and redirect ineffective allocated police funds. Uh, and we believe that the city should invest in alternatives to policing. Uh, again, if you haven't um, let us know where you're calling from, please drop it in the chat now. Uh, before we get started, um, I do wanna remind folks that if you have any questions throughout the program, please drop them in the Q&A section. Um, do not put them in the chat, that way we don't lose them. We wanna make sure we get to all the uh, questions uh, as possible. Uh, and then any commentary, just you know, leave, leave it in the chat. Uh, but next slide, please. And again, my name is Amy. Uh, I am the community organizer with Planned Parenthood. I'm here to talk to you about the American Rescue Plan. Um, so because of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, our city, the city of San Diego, has accrued over $86 million uh, in, a de uh, in a deficit. Uh, and this is as of November, 2020. The Biden administration has passed a third COVID relief bill uh, that is supposed to help with COVID-19 recovery. Uh, we are expected as a city to receive $306 million uh, in between like two or three years, I believe. Um, and this is actually more than enough to cover our deficit as well as fund our CBA ask. Uh, on the chart here on the screen, you can see um, how much each city uh, will be receiving throughout the county of San Diego. Uh, yes, our city is getting the most money um, and this is actually a perfect opportunity for us to invest uh, in our communities, uh, care for our communities uh, and ensure that they, um, you know, that we're funding um, programs that will, that will ultimately help our, our residents. Um, I will mention one thing that the American Rescue Plan, um, the funds that are coming in, there's really no clear guidelines as to how this funding must be used. Uh, we have an idea of what the mayor plans to use, uh, plans to do with some of this money. Um, and we are very appreciative with his, you know, San Diego get back to work plan. Um, we, we think uh, it's a step in the right direction, but we also know that it, unfortunately it's not enough. Um, and we know that the money that is coming in will be more than enough to cover our deficit, um, but it also will be enough to you know, fund all of our CBA asks. Um, and it is also important to note that in the previous COVID relief fund, SDPD actually received 15% of that funding. Uh, that is just simply um, unacceptable. This money is meant to use for COVID relief recovery. Um, there needs to be like a clear understanding that like the American Rescue Plan money should not fund SDPD. Uh, this money needs to serve our communities. It needs to provide rental assistance and fund alternatives to policing. Um, yeah, um, that's, that is um, my piece. Uh, I would like to now uh, introduce Yasmin Obeid, a youth organizer at Mid City Can, who is going to talk to us a little bit about uh, some of our CBA asks uh, and how we can use some of this American Rescue Plan, as well as continue using um, our budget to to fund um, the Commission on Police Practices. Uh, thank you all. Amazing. Thank you so much, Amy, for that wonderful introduction and start for our event. Hello, folks. My name is Yasmin Abid. Thank you all for joining us today. As Amy mentioned, I'm the youth organizer with Mid City Can, and um, we'll get started. So today I'll be speaking about the Commission on Police Practices, or what is known as CPP. The, um, next slide, please. 
first, before we start, who are we? Mid City Can um, Community Advocacy Network is a community collaborative who works in communities of color, specifically located in City Heights, um, to increase police accountability, improve transportation, advocate for restorative uh, practices, and build community power. That's really who we are and what we stand for. Uh, Youth Council is part of Mid City Can and who led the um, who led the fight along with San Diegans for Justice and other coalitional partners uh, to pass Measure B and establish CPP or the Commission on Police Practices. And Youth Council envisions a world where young people thrive and everything is possible when we invest in education and not incarceration. We believe, um, we believe with proper support, all young people can participate meaningfully in decision-making. Next slide, please. Awesome. So let's get back. Let's get right into it. What is the Commission on Police Practices? And pay really close attention because there'll be like a short test at the end, quick pop quiz. Um, so um, make sure you know what the Commission on Police Practices stands for. Next sl slide, please. Oh, no. That should not be the next slide. Can I get the next one, please? There we go. Thank you. So the Commission on Police Practices, uh, this is something that, as I mentioned, was created when Measure B passed in 2020. So November 2020, what is officially known now as the Commission on Police Practices um, was created. It, previously, there was an oversight body called the Community Review Bo Board. However, um, it was not the same as what is um, the Commission on Police Practices. And because one, they didn't have the same powers currently, um, and it wasn't independent. So previously, the review board um, uh, didn't have subpoena power, so it, it couldn't actually make a difference. While now the Commission on Police Practices has that power, can make a difference, and is independent from the police department and the DA. So that's wonderful. Right now, members of what was known as CRB are currently serving um, and known as interim CPP. And then the commission will have independent, as I said, oversight of the department included subpoena power, freedom to conduct its own investigations into police shootings and other use of force incidents. Next slide, please. Awesome. So a little timeline of when the campaign started to win CPP, as well as what are our next steps. So uh, Mid City Can Youth Council, as I mentioned, as well as San Diegans for Justice and Women Occupy San Diego, took on this project and this campaign of creating an independent community-led commission on police practices. So it started, the process started in 2018, if we can, uh, if you, we all see here, where the decision to take on this campaign took place. Um, after that, we had Mid-City Can um, Youth Council created a beautiful schools, not prisons, mural in City Heights. If you pass by, you should definitely check it out. After that, it passed through the Rules Committee, Public Safety and Livable Neighborhoods Committee. And then finally, it reached City Council um, meet and, con and confer authorization. And then it moved um, out of that uh, phase as well, out of that process. So um, that's kind of, um, that puts us in June, 2020. And then finally, City Council voted to actually place the proposal on the November 2020 ballot in order for San Diegans like yourself to vote and show whether or not they want this commission to happen. So his, uh, on, um, um, on that is the wrong date, please forgive me. On uh, November 3rd, 2020, uh, Measure B passed with a historical win of over 75% San Diegan support in it. So that was incredible. We're so proud of San Diegans for supporting Measure B and making sure that we are establishing a commission on police practices. So what are the next steps? Currently, we are waiting for um, the mayor to allocate the funds to make sure that this commission can actually work independently and investigate um, and have the power to investigate and the money to do this investigation. So all nine city council members allocated money 
in their budgets towards the commission. And the next step is for the mayor to allocate funds in his budget, which is released really soon, April 15th. So keep an eye on that. Uh, we're asking the mayor to allocate at least 1.1 million for this commission. After the money in budget is allocated, at the same time, there's the ordinance language is being also created within city council. So once, um, once the budget is allocated, we're looking to ensure that city council adopts the ordinance language in order to establish the commission. And once that happens, then the whole process to establish the commission, which includes choosing the members who will be serving on this commission, hiring the staff that will support with this commission and so many other steps. Um, that process will only take place after the actual city, after the um, uh, ordinance language is adopted by city council and after the mayor allocates funding. So we're still waiting on those three points. Um, and just to clarify, CPP is technically not yet established, right? We have who, uh, folks who are serving as interim CPP. However, the actual Commission on Police Practices has not yet been created. Um, it will not be created until those steps take place. So the fight, we won a huge, um, we won a huge step, which is actually voting to get it to make it happen. However, the process of making it happen is not over, and we still need folks' support to do that. Next slide, please. So what is Mid City Can's um, ask or the Youth Council's ask for the commission itself? Um, we are asking for two things. One, to for uh, the 1.1 million or more to be allocated towards this commission. And then number two, we're also asking for two youth seats to be on this commission. And why is that important? Uh, why is it important to have youth voices on this commission? Uh, next slide, please. So there's a lot of things. One, youth are actually uh, highly impacted by police violence and they're highly, um, um, they're highly impacted by police violence and they also make up a huge percentage of our community. The 75% that voted to pass this commission and to pass Measure B included youth and youth deserve to have a voice on what happens in our communities and deserve to share their experiences and their lived experiences um, with police and with police misconduct, unfortunately. Um, as, we, as I mentioned, they report a higher rate of police violence than others. They also report physical violence, my timer, um, and others. So youth are affected the most, um, or youth are one of the, high, the most impacted groups um, who are affected. Next slide, please. Two. Um, there's actually within the, we have 47 San Diego, San Diego commissions and only one of them has seats for youth. That is not acceptable. Again, youth make up a huge percentage of our communities and our huge percentage of our population, yet they're not given the power or the ability to actually show up and to actually do the work and to be part of decision-making. That's unacceptable. And we need to make sure that we're allowing youth to be there on the table and to be decision makers as well, not just be there in presence. Next slide, please. And finally, those are two, um, um, two testimonies from our own youth council members who really are really passionate about, about this. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave you all, give you all 30 seconds to read these testimonies in here directly from youth who are within the age of 18 to 24, why it's important to them to have these seats. Awesome, I hope you all got a chance to read that. Um, with that, really, that wraps up my presentation. If we can go to the next slide, please. All so much for listening. Remember, City Council and the Mayor, one, you, they need to allocate more than $1.1 million towards this commission. And two, they need to allocate two youth seats uh,
that youth voices are represented. Please contact me if you're interested in getting involved. If you're 18 years old or younger, please um, reach out to me and join our city, uh, our youth council. We would love to have you follow our youth council on Instagram and pledge your support for youth seats on CPP. And with that, we can go to our poll question. So as I said, there is a question, what does CPP stand for? Please take a moment to respond. I hope that you all now know what it stands for and that you continue to um, engage with CPP in the process. Yes, amazing. 100% of you knows what commission, what CPP stands for. That is wonderful. Thank you all for paying attention. With that, I'll go ahead and pass it to our wonderful organizer, Jamie Wilson um, for, uh, with Pillars of the Community. Jamie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm with Pillars of the Community, and we're going to talk about what we would like to see in place for youth violence prevention programs, um, what it looks like, what we're envisioning, um, and how we're going to get there. Change the slide, please. So of eight neighborhoods, eight specific sections of Southeast San Diego, East Diego that we would like to focus on and need, need the assistance um, regarding youth violence prevention programs and that's City Heights, Barrio Logan, Memorial, Mount Hope, Ocean View, Lincoln Park, Encanto, and Skyline. Can you change the slide please? What we want to see happen in these communities and these eight specific communities are drop in centers created where there are computer labs, we have positive um, activities such as boxing. Um, music, there used to be a place in the hood that was that had a studio, um, we want to see weightlifting. Um, a lot of positive physical programs, and then we'll move on to the other programs that we want to see offered as well. Change the slide, please. We would like to see the people running these programs um to be people who are from the community they live in the community they have ties in the community um to that specific section of the community um, these are paid positions that would employ uh, people who would be able to relate to what the youth in that specific community go through what they've been through what they face on a daily basis um, someone who is still well respected within the community, um, someone who understands the unique obstacles that the youth in that community go through, um, potentially someone who has had some experience with the criminal justice system at some point. Um, they need to have a cultural understanding of the, the gangs in that area, um, experience with the different subcultures within the community. Uh, this person, these staff members that we want staffed in these positions would know about current events going on in the community because then you know what to look for um, as far as the kids' stress levels go. When we have a murder in the community, 
kids are going to have a different type of a stress level. Their mind state is going to be a lot different. So these people who will be staffed at these drop-in centers will know what to look for. They'll be able to stop any, any type of altercation. They'll see it coming before the youth would even see it coming and they'll be able to intervene in a positive and productive way without law enforcement. Can you change the slide, please? Additionally, we want to have therapy um, that would be offered at, the drop, at these drop-in centers specifically for the youth, social, emotional, and cognitive programs. Um, again, non-police involved, non-law enforcement. Um, these wouldn't be drop-in centers that are teamed up with law enforcement in any way. These would be safe places and these types of positive therapy would be provided by people that the youth can, can trust and can come and talk to whenever they, whenever they need to. This is a program that we think is really important as part of a drop-in center and not just the physical, um, the type of physical activity and programs. Next slide, please. We skipped one, if we could go back. The is a 24 hour crisis line that we want to have Okay, that's one. Yep. So we want to have a, a 24 hour crisis line where members of the community, again, not law enforcement, would be there to answer the phone for any event that might happen day, night. Um, we answer the phone, we respond, and we would show up at a scene where any, any violent act, a murder, um, anything happened, the community would be able to respond in a healthy and productive way, as opposed to law enforcement who are not trusted by the community, they're not trusted by the youth, there wouldn't be a connection. And this is something also that we would like members of the community um, who have lived experiences that they'll be responding to, they have had the, those same experiences in their life. Next slide, please. Violence prevention case managers. Um, these case managers who are again, not affiliated with law enforcement would provide trauma-informed care ongoing, um, a wraparound type for the entire family um, immediately following a traumatic or violent incident. Uh, these case managers will work both with the victim family as well as the, the family and the individual accused of um, being responsible. Um, for the behavior that happened in this incident. There are always two sides facing separate traumas as the result of the same event. So to prevent further violence, that requires that both sides are cared for and not just, not just one. Next slide, please. Continuous exposure to negative encounters with law enforcement, introduction into the criminal justice system, punitive responses to either normal youthful behaviors 
or correctable teachable behaviors during these formative years of a young person's life are not a solution to preventing violence among youth. Next slide, please. Part of the programs that we want to have in these drop-in centers would be financial literacy, um, programs that provide certificates that would are, are recognized um, for jobs, actual um, employment, um, teaching someone how to bank a resume and to handle their finances. Next slide, please. Program opportunities for a youth who has um, been a part of the program and successful in different areas of the program and uh, maintained, we would like them to be able to travel within the country, leave San Diego, um, and to experience shared struggles that, that they have with people in our country and outside of our country. And these are, that's another very important program that some, a lot of our youth have never left San Diego. Um, they grew up and they've never, they still never have never left. And it's very important to see um, what is out there in different parts of the world and the country. Next slide, please. We as adults have to understand that in order to help our youth understand, um, we need to understand. And this is the history of the community um, and oppression, the culture, the conflict, the obstacles, the possibilities, the triumphs. Um, above everything else, the youth have to feel protected, protected and safe and understood. And these drop-in centers and the people who will be in them will provide that. Next slide, please. Countering trauma and ending ongoing trauma equals youth violence prevention. Um, the fight to end youth violence will continue to be just that. It will be an ongoing fight no matter what efforts are put forth, um, if we're not stopping the ongoing trauma that the youth are facing on a daily basis. We can't be with them every second. We can't protect them if we're not with them. And according to the SDSU study on racial profiling, the annual RIPA report, Campaign Zero's in-depth study of police harassment and the annual CalGang data report, the youth in these eight sections of Southeast San Diego are enduring these demeaning encounters at an alarming rate. We estimate the cost of these drop-in centers to be somewhere around 8 million. And that might off top sound like quite a bit of money, um, but it's not. It's not when we're paying police overtime at over $38 million, that's not even inclusive of salaries. And the trauma is being brought by these police officers to take 8 million and put it into a counter to the trauma isn't asking too much. And that is the end of my, the youth uh, violence prevention program. And I'm going to pass it on to Liliana and Layla from Youth Will, and they're going to talk about the transitional age unit. Thank you. Hello, thank you, Jamie. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Liliana Soriano Garista. I am a student at UCSD and a member of Youth Will in the Youth Justice Program, I mean team, and I'm with Layla. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for being here. My name is Layla Del Rio. Um, I'm a student at, a senior at Helix High School and um, I'm a resource emergency ambassador with Youth Will and also a member of the Youth Justice team. Uh, next slide, please. 
So a little bit more about Youth Will and our nonprofit is that our vision in Youth Will is to be able to create a future in which every young person has what they need to be happy, healthy, and prepared to reach our potential. So how we plan to reach these goals is through building youth power, improving youth development, and demanding youth prioritization. This is why today we will be speaking on the TAN unit as we continue with this presentation. Next slide, please. All right, so like Liliana said, we're gonna be focusing on the transitional age youth unit, um, and we will be referring to it as the TAE unit. Um, our transitional age unit aims to treat young people like young people. So essentially, we are focusing on ages 18 through 25. And we're doing this because of the fact that there is scientific evidence that those who are 18 to 25 are still developing their brains, their um, frontal cortex is still developing, which means that their decision-making skills are still developing, they're still learning and growing. And this age range has difficulty because not only are they adjusting to the quote unquote real life, but they also are being treated as adults when really they aren't. 18 year olds can't drink. Um, 18 year olds can't do a variety of things because of the fact that they aren't legally adults or aren't legally, you know what I mean. Um, and 25 year olds haven't reached that peak developmental stage. So this specific age range is at a disadvantage and we're aiming to um, change that with the different components of our TAE unit. Next slide, please. Yeah, so thank you, Ayla. So the importance of the TAE unit is to establish a program like this to fill in the voids through healing and support necessary to connect young people who fell into the unethical justice system back to the communities they left behind. And more importantly, to express that we should move on with solutions to these problems in our society and communities of color through the establishment of this program, which would allow us to bring in the motion the act of less policing and more community engagement. By training these young people as young people and not as criminals, prevents further marginalization and alienation from their communities. Um, also, it is very important to us because Leila and I as young people, we want to be able to feel like there is no gap between us and the youth that is incarcerated. So yeah, um, next slide, please. Thank you. So the first uh, couple components that we're gonna talk about um, are these first three. So first we have the trauma-informed care component. Um, this is one of the more important ones in my opinion, mostly because of the fact that this is a curated training for probation officers, sheriffs, um, people in touch with the Tay population. And one of the things that I think makes it so unique is that it's training that is specified to have input from trauma impacted individuals. Um, and this is something that's very important. And it's also something that is tied closely together with our youth co-facilitators um, because as well as wanting input from trauma impacted individuals, we want input from youth who have been through the system and who, have under, who understand what the individuals, what the 18 to 25 year olds who are in the system and are in the justice system are going through. Um, additionally, with the youth co-facilitators, um, this one other thing to mention is that we are also calling for the elimination of the 150 administration, administrative fee for the, for the community justice initiative. Um, at the moment, that is a program that allows those who commit quality of life or um, small misdemeanor crimes, they can go through this program and then come out with no charges. And however, the fact of the matter is, is that the people who actually need this type of program won't be able to afford that 150 charge. So that's why we're calling for the elimination of that fee. And finally, um, one other component um, that's a part of our unit is the specialized staff. And this is essentially saying that everyone who's in contact with our TAE population will be trained in our trauma-informed care. And 
Um, this basically is saying that all of our staff who's working with our 18 to 25 year olds will be trained in both the trauma informed care and in the, the training that's been that's been created with input by youth co facilitators. Um, next slide, please. So this is essentially this slide is essentially talking about the importance of these um, components. So first of all, both the trauma informed care and youth co facilitators are very similar. Um, having a training that includes those who have been trauma impacted and those who are youth allows for a clearer picture of what they're really going through. It allows for sympathy, it allows for empathy, it allows for a better understanding of how we should be treating 18 to 25 year olds and those who are system impacted. It allows for us to treat them as humans and individuals rather than just people who we have to look out or worry for. So that's why that part is important. Um, and as for the specialized staff, it ensures that the TAY population is being focused on the way that they need to be focused on. And it allows for a specific set of individuals, specific members who are focusing solely on these 18 and 25 year olds and making sure that they're getting the attention, making sure that they're getting what they need to thrive in the world. Um, next slide, please. So another element of the TE unit would be uh, the culturally responsive system, which would respond to trauma inflicted by the justice system and serve as a healing practice and self-growth enactment. How, you may ask yourself, through expert-led healing circles, led by external community organize, uh, organizers and organizations, and improve the youth responsiveness to communities they identify with. Next slide, please. And lastly, our restorative justice coordinator that would review cases on young people and, and these restorative justice coordinators are also trained in trauma-informed care that would specialize with people in the age range, age range of 18 to 25. They will review the cases of youth who commit misdemeanors within the city of San Diego in order to recommend the best steps forward to ensure young people are not further harmed or traumatized, but are rather offered opportunities to learn from their mistakes. Um, that's how it would happen. And the importance of having this is to also have someone who teaches and practices these healing circles for the youth who do have traumatic experiences in the justice system. But that is all for the Reservative Justice Coordinator slide. Um, next slide, please. And this wraps up our presentation on the TAE unit. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Um, make sure to follow our Instagram, which is we are youth will on Instagram and Facebook as well. Um, and if you have any questions, be sure to put them in the Q&A um, and we'll be passing it to Jamie and Amy. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that amazing presentation, uh, Liliana and Layla. Um, love hearing youth initiatives. Uh, give us one quick second. I will be sharing my screen if I can find, it. yes. So now folks, um, we will be uh, going through a, um, we're gonna be doing an activity with all of you. Um, I'm dropping a link for a Jamboard. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Jamboard, um, it's super simple to use. Um, as you can see here, um, we have some different, um, what's the word, <laughs> functions. Uh, you can either, you know, do a pen where you can actually draw. Sorry, that's like really horrible drawing. <laughs> Ignore that. Oh, no, that did not meant to do that. What happened? Okay, there you go. Uh, you can erase. So if I like do something really crappy, I can go back and I can, you know, erase. So cool, you know? Uh, awesome. Uh, you can also, uh, the best way to use this is to put in little sticky notes and you can actually um, do it right here. Uh, sticky note. You would write, you know, 
you would write your answer. But anyways, we are going to talk about what does it mean to invest in our communities and what does it mean to you um, to invest in communities instead of policing. So we're gonna give you folks uh, a couple of seconds, maybe like a minute or two to actually go on here and write uh, either using a sticky note, you can draw, uh, you can insert an image, you can add an image here um, as to what it means to you. Uh, we want you to be either as creative or as descriptive as you, um, you know, are, or it could be. Um, and yeah, it seems like some folks are already starting to, to write things. Um, so yeah, we'll give you, we, we'll give you all two minutes. Uh, in the meantime, I guess we can play some music or something. So there's like not that awkward silence. What should we play for them, Jamie? I think we should go ahead and go with what we talked about earlier. Let's do it. <laughs> Let me look it up. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Jean, we is sitting there probably screaming right now. Don't do it. <laughs> Love you, Jean, we. <laughs> And if for some reason you are having issues with the Jamboard, let me know or let, drop it like drop it in the chat, and we'll try to you know work with y'all. I think we can get um we get started in this, Jamie. We can start elaborating on some of this. Um, so it seems like people have a good idea of what it means for them to invest in communities instead of um, policing. And I'm really excited to see what y'all have to say. Uh, fully fund the Commission on Police Practices. Yes, um, as I believe it was Jasmine who was mentioning earlier, like there was a board previously, but it just didn't work, right, Jamie? Like it just yeah there wasn't um there was too much of a relationship between the crb and the police that's my experience my personal experience um was that any complaint ever filed um even even matters that were civilly settled where it was recognized that there was a wrongdoing for some reason it wasn't found that there was no wrongdoing founded by the CRB. Um, so we're really excited to have this, this new board. They put a lot of work into it for years and I'm happy to see that it's here. I think that's, uh, Amy, and you're going to have to help read. I'm going blind in my old age. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, a comment in, uh, in the chat uh, from Sophia. You know this i believe the crb also had police in it so um you know that's that's always a uh, good to know awesome so we'll go to another one uh listen to the opinions community members of all ages and fund what they say that they need uh yes i 1000 percent agree with that um i know it's like sometimes can be really frustrating um for like the younger folks one because like you know they can't vote and they're like you know we're the ones that are being impacted the most by some of these um systems of policing um and yeah like we can call city council we can like you know make them stay there until midnight and they'll sometimes still you know sometimes council members will still vote against uh the community needs and what the community is asking for um but i have faith that like we will be able to to change that soon uh what do you think jamie Definitely listening to the youth is always the first thing that we need to do when we're talking about what needs to be done for them. But if we also have a lot of youth who won't come forward and speak. They're just begging really for basic needs to be met, meaning safety. And so I would like to get a lot of these youth to the point where they feel like they can come forward and speak, but we need to get their basic needs met first definitely the youth have to be consulted in anything that has to do with what's best for them. Yeah. Also, 
Yeah, no, for sure. I also want to uplift a comment um, from Anne. Respected individuals experience and validate their feelings, provide positive outlets for growth. I think that's what you were talking about also earlier, Jamie, um, with the uh, adult violence prevention program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, um, definitely. We see some stuff on like mentoring, um, free college, free healthcare, free public transportation. That's like 1000% valid. That, that the transportation part is huge. How many times um, a single mother or father who's working a lot of hours has to take out of there to not go to work and then go to court and face this, this ticket for not having an affair on the trolley going to and from an athletic event, maybe going to see their friends, going to school, back from school. It's ridiculous that we can't offer the youth especially in communities where um, we're very low income, free transportation. Yeah, no, 1000%. Um, what you say is 100% valid. Um, let me look through something, uh, some other ones. Um, age appropriate intervention. Um, definitely, I think if we need to really center in on like uh, trauma informed care and obviously age appropriate intervention, um, sometimes we treat some of these children as if they are adults. And I think that's what uh, Liliana um, and uh, Layla were talking about, you know, a few moments ago is that like, we sometimes treat these children as if they are adults. We tend to criminalize black boys as if they are, you know, adult men, and that's not the case. Um, and it's really unfortunate because this trauma like lingers with these children for years. And this is like how we end up you know, with the school to prison pipeline where like these students are constantly being, um, you know, sorry, I completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> Jamie, help Definitely me out Definitely agree with you. And there was actually a, a study done not too long ago that actually showed that black and brown youth are viewed and treated as if they are four to five years older than what they actually are. There was actually a study done on that. So age appropriate, um, less punitive responses to everything that, mm -hmm. that it does nothing. Everyone yeah. just call the police, call the police. They're, they're yeah. no, part of the cycle. Yeah. Um, addressing healthcare disparities and invest investing addressing. Uh, yeah. Um, that's, I mean, realistically, one of the biggest things is like, are also like our lack of healthcare and like access to like healthcare also is not how we take care of our community. Like we need to fund, we need to make sure that like people are able to live in their community and like not fear of like going outside or knowing that they have the resources that they need to like actually live a healthy life. Like not having a bunch of food deserts, having access to like you know, good produce, having access to like a community clinic of like folks that look like them that are from the community, like all these things are so like, you know, they intersect and they are very much part of, you know, addressing this like system of policing and whatnot. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, sorry, I'm, tr I'm trying to help really you, Amy, but I'm like, <laughs> it's so small, y'all. Um, let me see, move away from the idea that increased policing equals safety and fund our schools and community organizations invest in each other. Yes, I, I love that. Um, I think we can all agree that the communities with the most resources or the community with the most resources are like the safest and the healthiest, not the communities that have the most police. Wouldn't you say so, Jamie? Yeah, I think there's a lot of people that can't even, they, they can't visualize, they, they wouldn't be able to understand or even imagine what these kids go through on a daily basis. Um, I'm going to put together a compilation of some videos after I blur out faces, but it's just, it's, it's, it's not even imaginable. And unless there's someone standing there in front of them or, you know, you, we are there to advocate for them when the police are there, this is happening. It happens during the day. It happens at night. It happens on the weekends. It happens 
it happens all the time. And years and years of being handcuffed and put on sidewalks and no one's advocating for you. No one's listening. No one cares. You don't hear about it on the news. Um, kids give up. It does something to somebody growing up like that. You don't have faith in, in, in the world. You don't have faith in, in, in people doing the right thing. Or, and you start to internalize that this is the way it's supposed to be. I, I am maybe what these police officers say I am and the way they treat me every day. So we, that, that part really has to go. That's the basic needs that, um, that I'm talking about is just providing a sense of safety. No, yeah, um, I 1000% agree with you. And I, I wanna yeah, go back to what you were mentioning. <laughs> no, they are. Um, I wanna go back to what you're saying is like the stuff that some of our youth are, you know, that they go through, um, you know, being in handcuffs, being, you, you know, sometimes our youth go, go to school and this is like where, you know, they're supposed to learn how to navigate through the world. And unfortunately, sometimes like the education system is like, <laughs> it could be very racist. Um, I've experienced it firsthand myself. Um, we like we don't prepare our students well enough and we constantly tell them like that they're not good enough so how can we expect our students to go out go to college when they're constant like they do not they cannot escape this like constant berating and being told that they're not good enough and you know they go from home they go from school they go out you know to the streets where like they're they want to just hang out and like they're being literally harassed by the cops and it's really like unfortunate because there's it needs we need like a bigger intervention like we need to we need to actually spend money on social workers on mental health professionals that will actually like have the tools to like communicate with our children and like actually be able to understand and like we also need folks that like are from the community because if we bring in outsiders that sometimes does not help the situation because they can't understand the trauma that our children have gone through and I think we kind of talked about that uh, like a few days ago um and yeah like it's it's really important that like we we begin to invest in these children uh and our students um to actually hope and like expect an like a change and an out you know a change in outcomes uh because if we continue yeah. to fund the same things if we continue to put money in the same things that are proved like clearly proven by studies like they're not working so why is like our city council why is our mayor willing to spend more money on sdpd and all like these programs ha huh? and like the gang unit intervention whatever it is like they're not working we are telling you community is telling you so like what language do I got to tell you? Like, do I got to draw it for you? Like, what do we need to do? People um, want the research. The research is there. The research has been there for years. It continues to be provided every single year. Mm -hmm. And I've said this um, at a few different speaking events. It's so crazy to me that I'm actually, we're, there's people, there's groups, there's us, the CBA, we're, we're asking people to stop funding traumatizing our kids and us we're asking for that we actually have to ask that and talk you into it and say can you please stop giving money to these things that are directly impacting us and our kids um and it's just it's it's bizarre to me no and we have to with the school system also we have to i have seven children and at one point one year i had kids going to five different schools so i was driving to five different schools and that's because teachers don't understand schools don't understand that these kids are not cookie cutter kids each child is different they learn at different rates they learn better in different situations and so i i match my children up and i have to drive different places because at one school this this child is thriving at the other school, they were made to sit outside of their classroom every single day of the week. And it's just, it's, it has to, it has to start within the schools too. No, I definitely get that. Um, 
I want to read a couple more um, comments before we move into our ask. Um, but let's see. Um, yeah, like you were saying, fun drop-in centers, housing, healthcare, and jobs. Like, if we don't give like our youth somewhere to meet, somewhere to be creative, like, you know, like I was a youth, like I would, you know, I'd get bored and be like, all right, let's go fuck around, like it's also those things like, you know, the job, like, um, readiness type of like courses and like resume building, like you find that in like wealthy neighborhoods, like why, like his parents could pay for it. Like, unfortunately my parents could not pay for me to, you know, have an amazing tutor, you know, for me to, you know, go to some resume building, like all these things, like I had to go out and either learn on my own or I was like shit out of luck. And either like other folks would get opportunities. Um, and that's also like one of the things that like, I feel like the youth sometimes will get like, you know, discouraged. Um, and it's like, if we had, we have the funding, like, I'm not saying that we don't like, oh, it's we there. Have the funding. Sure. It's yeah. there. Um, it's just like, do politicians care enough? Like, what do we need to do? Um, and we have I know a we'll program get into, like, actually we did with um, the city of San Diego two summers ago and they came in and they provided positions for the youth during the summer. So it was something they got to work for the city. They had got to put it on their resume. They had a job for the summer. There used to be a higher youth program when I was younger that I worked at when I was 14 or 15 and it was during the summer and that was how I bought school clothes. That was how I survived. Sometimes I didn't have somewhere to live and these things are crucial. I don't even know where I would have been sometimes without those programs. Yeah. And I think it's also like fair to say that, um, you know, these programs that we're, you know, also asking for and advocating for, we also want them, you know, we don't want them to be tied with like police or any, like we want some of these programs to actually be led by community led groups, like by BIPOC. They have to be. They or have they're to not be. successful because they, I'm going to say this very loudly. You cannot, you cannot fund programs that continue to outcast the people that need the youth that need to be reached the most. They cannot, we, it's not productive. We're, they're taking in children who have um, turned their lives around, quote unquote. And but where does that leave us? Everybody's in the same position. The same kids experiencing the trauma and everything else are in the same position. They're outcasted once again from these programs um, that are ran by police officers or religious leaders that um, do not fully accept them as, as people um, if they don't conform to what they're expecting their life to be. And that, that, isn't, that isn't what we're here for yeah that's that's, that's also so detrimental like it just goes back into you know like we're being told like we're not good enough or we're not mm -hmm. you know that they're not you know they're not meant to be you know i don't know i don't want to get into it <laughs> sorry yeah um but yeah no i definitely think all you say is very very valid um also i don't know if you saw but on the chat it seems like people want us to start a podcast let's do it like let's start <laughs> recording ourselves talking about all the injustices uh <laughs> link to follow y'all just kidding <laughs> but okay cool um it seems like yes you all have some um amazing uh you know ideas as to you know how do we invest in communities instead of policing uh and one that i really want to uplift because it's also like the only image that folks have uh have posted here it's this park um I know like we talk a lot about um you know police accountability and like different programs like but also we need green spaces like our children need green spaces the fact that like in my neighborhood if i want to go to a park i gotta drive like two three miles out but if i go anywhere like near la jolla or you know near um what is it? I'm trying to blank on the neighborhood, but like all these white neighborhoods, like they have access to green spaces. There's like giant parks and it's not just like, it's not like, a like there's like good, nice play structures. There's updated facilities. Like why can't my neighborhood get that? Like my, you know, the youth in my neighborhood 
deserves that park just as much as anyone in, you know, someone from district one or someone from district three, you know, like it's those things that our community, like we're not asking for much. Like I, it's just crazy. The fact that we also have to have this conversation, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but <laughs> anyways, um, we can go ahead and wrap this up. Is there anything else that we want to uplift before we go in? We talk about um, actually how we can incorporate everyone's ask um, and then turn it into, or how we've turned it into an um, to an ask uh, for the CBA. Um, let me see. Um, yeah, meeting people where they're at and not punishing them for existing, putting money into supporting them in ways uh, that they tell you. Yeah. Like just listen to community. That's what the community wants. Sweet. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. That was uh, a it, fun jam board. I that love nice. that. Um, <laughs> I very much loved everyone's uh, commentary on like, you know, on the jam board and also mm -hmm. um, this uh, this amazing chat where it's like it seems like everyone. Yeah, we're gonna we need to start a podcast. That's what the people want, Jamie. Let's do it. <laughs> Awesome. Um, if we can get the um, the the screen share again, uh, John Wee, whenever possible. Awesome. So, uh, as we were mentioning earlier, uh, the CBA has actually created um, or has an ask specific to creating a redefining public sector public safety action plan. Um, essentially, what we want is the city to develop and implement alternatives to policing. Uh, this plan will serve as a blueprint for the city of San Diego to begin creating a systemic change for our region by addressing racial injustice, redefining public safety, uh, you know, over on our communities. Uh, we really want this, or well, we need the city to partner with individuals impacted by police violence and BIPOC-led um, uh, community groups, um, prioritizing, oh, sorry, <laughs> prioritizing and centering back uh, black led groups. Uh, we also we need to make sure that they do not include any non police city officials or include non, non police city officials um, and into the independent budget analysis office uh, in the plan to develop uh, in the plan development process to ensure active support and implementation across uh, the city programs. Um, one thing I, I want to mention about this is that, you know, this, this action plan, um, it would essentially be for community based responses to local emergencies, uh, you know, public health crisis, folks experiencing homelessness, the mental health crisis, intimate partner violence, um, and many others. Um, I think we really need to start thinking of ways of how we can actually have other folks, train folks, like experts, therapists, um, answer the calls or, you know, ask, you know, or are able to, to respond to these, um, these types of situations. Um, am I missing something, Jamie? No? I think you're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Um, awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, realistically, like, we really just need trauma-informed de-escalation and harm reduction techniques. That's, that's the bottom line. Um, and it seems like you all in the chat, um, on the jam board, this is what the community wants. Um, and I think now it's, it's really about like, how do we get there? What do, what do we have to do? Um, I think one of the things like for me that I think about it is just like really like, one, it's like getting folks that like aren't gonna take money from like a POA or will actually um, put community interest over special interests. Um, yeah, I feel like I was missing something, Jamie. No, I think you got it. Um, I think that people get backed into a corner sometimes once they listen to a group like CBA, a group like us, and they hear this, and then they hear, um, the police narrative countering it and, um, we just need you to stick with us because those police officers do not live in our communities. They do not have children that go to school in our communities. Um, they don't grocery shop. 
where we grocery shop. They don't have the experiences that we do. Their first priority is to make sure that they are fully funded to continue to do what they are doing. And so when you're balancing out what you're listening to and where you're taking the advice from as far as where your vote is going to go or your phone calls are going to be made based on, you need, you need to pay attention to the community. Um, we're, we're not here because uh, we, we gain anything from this. You know, we're not, this isn't part of a budget. We're asking to go into our pockets. We're asking for us to be able to be well, um, emotionally, physically, um, and that's it. There's no, we have no, we, we don't have a dog in the fight about, about this money stuff. We just want it to be allocated away from harm and into something that's going to begin to address our healing. Yeah, um, I definitely wanna uplift what you were saying is like, you know, obviously stick with us. And um, even like what you were mentioning about, you know, it's not like our organizations are like greatly benefiting from any of this. Like, no, our communities are benefiting from this. Our youth are benefiting from this. Like. I'm not, you know, we're not advocating here like, oh, give, you know, pillars money, go give. No, we are asking for money for our communities, money that you all like, you know, contribute to because the budget like comes from your city, like your taxes, this is your money. Like, this is what we need y'all. Um, but is a there lot anything of our positions to a lot of people you see speaking are volunteers. We're, yeah. we're, these are not paid positions. These, this is what we're talking to you about because it means so much and it's so important. It's not, there's no financial gain here. Yeah, that's 100% true. Um, yeah, a lot of this work, it's not, it's not easy work. And yes, it's very true. A lot of us like either do this voluntary or, you know, we do it because we've experienced it and it's been part of our lives for mm -hmm. so long that we need to end that cycle of trauma and we are putting ourselves out there to make sure that the next generation does not have to continue to go through it because we've seen the damage and we continue to only add to that damage. And I think it's like enough is enough. Our students, our youth have suffered long enough. It is our duty and our responsibility to show up and make sure that, you know, we are the generation that ends this trauma. Um, but I think that is it. Um, uh, from from our, our our little piece, uh, I believe we will now be kicking it over to Chelsea, uh, who will be helping us go through some calls to action. Uh, take it away. Hi, y'all. Well, I hope y'all are inspired to take some action with us now. I think we're going to share screen on uh, some slides. Um, or do I do that? Or someone got it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so there's an opportunity to take action today. So if you go to this bit.ly, which um, I can drop in the chat for us. Um, oh, and that Kiara has done for us already. If you go to that bit.ly link, um, you'll see the action and use the one that says RPS2 um, for the action. And so we're going to go one by one together so that we're doing this all together. So step one is sending a quick email to Mayor Todd Gloria today. And this, this letter has already been pre-drafted. So if you click on that bit.ly link that says CBA email mayor, it'll take you um, to an action page. So I'm going to give folks 20 seconds to fill that out and submit it before we go on to our next um, action. So you got 20 seconds. Okay, that was 20 seconds. Hopefully you got time to submit it, but we're going to go on to the next one, which is step two, complete these two petitions. So one of them is the protect petition. Um, if you fill out your name there, you'll add your name to other folks who have signed on in support of protect, which would end consent searches and pretext stops. It would ban 
um, SDPD from being able to do those types of police practices. So I'll give folks 10 seconds to do that one because that one's a quick one. Awesome, that was 10 seconds. Okay, we're get, we're tearing right through. Woo! Okay, next one is about urging the mayor and city council members to support the Commission on Police Practice, which um, Yasmin just talked to us about. So if we can click that next bit.ly link that says CPP petition, it's the same thing real quick. I'm gonna give folks uh, 15 seconds to fill that out real quick. I see so many cursors on it. It's great it's seeing all these like different. Okay, that was 15 seconds. Now we're going to the main event. Now we're gonna call the mayor. Um, and John, we has so grace, uh, graciously um, been offered to be an example for this one. So basically, if you see below, it says call the mayor. There's a phone number right there. Um, you'll probably get voicemail. Um, so we're asking you to leave a voicemail. Um, and here's a script that you can use if you're not sure like what to say. Um, and these are things that are supporting um, what you just heard about today, the transitional age um, youth or the trans transitional age unit, um, the redefining public safety action plan, the youth violence prevention program. So that's the script right there. There's the phone number. Um, jean Wee, should I um, have you come on now to, to demo it? So what we're gonna do, cause in the spirit of doing it all together, um, jean Wee's gonna come off mute and call in. But while he's calling in, we're gonna ask you all to do the same. So you might wanna turn your volume down if you don't want John Wee's conversation getting into your phone conversation. Um, and we want everyone to come online. You're gonna be all um, panelists. And so you should be able to turn on your video. So let's try yes. that. Next. We're gonna make so, all, go ahead, John Wee. So we're gonna ask all the panelists, current panelists to help us move everyone else into the panelist side. And then we are gonna do this action live, calling into the mayor office. So look at this. Welcome to the other side of the world. And make sure you all please turn on your camera so that way you can be on the screen. Can you pop open the uh, the uh, image again, John Wee, please? Yes. Thank yes. you. Yes. Okay, so first off, this is the screen. Um, and then you all should be at home. Also, like for the folks who are attending the, the event right now, go ahead and do the screen. Um, and then the rest of us gonna, everyone on mute. And I'm gonna live calling the mayor office, Facebook live, yo. This is gonna be awesome. So you can dial his phone number 619-236-6330. Oh no, I forgot this, so. Calling the office of San Diego Mayor Todd Gloria. Our normal operating hours are 8:30 a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. Monday through Friday. Due to COVID-19, our office is closed to the public and staff is working remotely. To receive assistance, it is best to email our office at Mayor Todd Gloria at San Diego. Well, the folks, you can dial. Being monitored by staff during normal operating hours. If you would like to leave a voice note, please do so at the tone. Thank you for calling. Record your message at the tone. When you are finished, hang up or press pound for more options. Oh. Hi, Mayor Gloria. This is Zhang Wei. I live in the North Park um, community. I am calling you to ask you to prioritize care, not cops, in your 2021 and 2022 budget. Over the past 10 years, police budgets have consistently increased 
while budget for vital community resources have remained stagnant or have been slashed. But the safest community do not have the most cops, they have the most resources. San Diego must divest from the policing and invest in the health and well being of our communities. I ask that you diversify and strengthen alternative to police fund community groups to respond to emergency with drama informed approaches, the escalation and harm reduction techniques. Develop a youth violence prevention program led by individuals within the community, not by the police department. Stop the pipeline to prison and secure pathway to success by creating a trans transitional aid unit. Developing a redefining public safety action plan, support, pass, and implement the protect ordinance. It is time to prioritize people, community, and resources over policing. Thank you. Yay, I did it, y'all. It's super easy. You can do this too. Yes, you can totally do that. So on screen right now, I want you guys like with your phone. I want to see you on your phone, chatting into the box and leave the gazillion messages for the mayor. Yes. Okay, give folks a couple more minutes to make call. Yes. And then I will pass it on to Actually, we're moving in, into the Q and A session, so that means that right now we're gonna have conversation among all of us. Okay. Okay. So Q and A and upcoming events, John. John, we so Q and A and then events. Yeah. So Kira, um, can you help her with the, the question? Um, yeah, it looks like if anyone wants to add any um, other questions into the Q&A box, um, you can. Um, the first question that was answered, is there a clear timeline for the mayor's budget and the council's ordinance language? Um, and the answer is that yes, the mayor will be releasing his budget on April 15th. If the mayor happens to not include enough funding in his budget, the community can show up to city council and demand um, that he does on May 5th and May 17th. And the final vote for the budget will be um, on June 14th. And then regarding the ordinance, the timeline is not clear. We hope that the PSLN committee introduces the language on May 19th. Um, and then, that's all we have so far. So in the meantime, you know, if folks want to put more questions into the Q&A, uh, maybe we can announce those events and, and revisit um, any additional questions. So I have a question for you guys about the redefining public safety action plan. Like, what does that look like? Because I hear climate action campaign, right? But like, is that the same intention that you want to do in terms of for Republic? I mean, public safety? Can you remind me again of the climate, like what is there looks like? So it so could be very similar. Yeah, so the climate action campaign basically like all the environmental justice activists came together and then they think of like a future plan, like a long term campaign, and they basically go back and hit on the mark and then trying to like push toward that vision, right? So for redefining public safety action plan, is that a similar goal that you're trying to do? Like you build a vision of a future and then we're all going to have like a the huge hit grand plan of what that's going to look like? Yeah, um, I think, I mean, that's always the goal. Like, it's they're never just like pilot programs. Like, let's try it one year and see if it's going to work. Like, no, we want this to be long term. Um, and we also want it to be, you know, like we were mentioning, it was like led by um, folks that have been impacted by police violence um, and even like. Uh, black let's um cent or centers uh black folks um but yeah i think the way that 
I mean, even I imagine it, it's just like, like 10 year plan. And it's just like, what are we gonna do in 10 years for the city of San Diego? Um, and what what is it gonna take for us to get to where we wanna be? Um, yeah. <laughs> So are you guys gonna be, so the exercise of Gambor, is that what you're gonna basically getting the community input and then you're gonna create that plan for all of us and gonna share it out? Yeah, that's definitely the plan. Um, we wanna make sure that like we don't take, you know, we take communities input before, we, you know, we set something out um, because what's the point of like also creating these uh, these programs if like we're not taking community input. Uh, but yeah, all of the um, all of the recommendations and like what people want to see in this redefining public safety action plan will definitely be taken into consideration um, as we develop this um, this plan. Okay. So um, I want to move the conversation next to the other three um, section with the panelists. I can help you to notice that they all youth related. But before I'm going to move in there, I would just want to kind of share this event that coming up hosted by Miss City Can Youth. Um, I want to give a shout out to the youth at Miss City Can. You guys are amazing. Every time it showed up to your event, it's super amazing. I want to encourage people to show up to this, this event as well. Yakmi, do you want to share a little bit about this event? Yes. Can you all see my camera? Uh -huh. Or no? OK, great. Um, hello, folks. So again, this event is going to uh, uplift the voices of our youth council members as well as community members. It's tomorrow at 6 p.m. It's only going to be an hour-ish, so please come show up for our youth support. Um, we'll have Spanish interpretation. They'll be discussing why, again, it's important to have youth voices on the commission. Um, and you'll be hearing directly from our, our youth council members, um, as well as other community members who have been involved with the process. So come out again tomorrow, Wednesday at 6 p.m. And I will drop the RSVP link in the chat. Thanks, y'all. And um, Chelsea, if you want to share the other informational item. Yes. yes. Um, and so the petition that you signed earlier was a protect petition. Um, and we are actually, CPAT is having folks um, tune into city council next week, Tuesday at 11 o'clock because um, city council will be hearing directly from campaign zero on their report looking at bias policing. And so since city council is having a conversation about bias policing, this is an opportunity for us to go hard and say loud and clear that city council needs to pass protect, which would ban pretext stops and consent searches, which are things that we know police disproportionately use on black and brown people. Um, so if you're available, join us next week, Tuesday, um, 11 o'clock to call in support in support of protect. Of course, we're gonna follow C path and then getting all the information as a reminder um, on like next week. Yeah, we we'll make sure all, everyone yeah. shows up. If you follow us on um, social media, C path San Diego, you can get information there. Um, and if you're already you know connected with us, we'll we'll email you um, from our list. Okay. And um, lastly, for all the folks who have been joining us. For the panel event that every Tuesday that we've been having. Um, it's the intention of the CBA coalition to basically share with the community all of the work that we've been doing and advocating for everyone to getting involved and show up to the budget hearing. So as you can tell, the budget is super important. It's a more more document of our city, how we spend the money. And um, I want to my folks is that when it came down to it, this is how we're gonna move a lot of program and change, make, create like meaningful changes within our community and bring the resources back to the community and into our people um, that we need. So the first budget hearing gonna be May 5th. So please look out for that. And then we're gonna need everyone showed up there advocating for all of the important demand from, you know, for our communities. So I'll pass it on, I'll pass it to Amy to close it out now. 
Awesome. Thank you all um, so much. Uh, I want to personally thank all of our panelists uh, for working really hard on uh, your presentations. I want to thank uh, John Wee for, uh, you know, showing us how to call the mayor. I appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank all of you for taking the time to joining us. Uh, we understand, you know, I'm sure most of you just got out of work. Uh, thank you for, you know, being a part of this conversation. Uh, it's an important conversation. It's a painful conversation, but it's a conversation that needs to be had. Um, we um, we would love to you know see you um, at the upcoming budget hearings. Uh, if you're not following the CBA yet, please follow the CBA on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, at CBA underscore San Diego. Um, I believe I, we, we dropped those links, uh, but yeah, I believe that is it for the for our evening, folks. Uh, have a wonderful night. Uh, have a great um, rest of your day. Thank you. Adios, everyone.